that's kind of how I feel about this whole broader like L2 renaissance and what's possible in, in the Bitcoin world. Like, I don't care if it sinks or swims. I'm pretty sure it's going to be very successful. But even if it's not like this is ideas worth pursuing, you know, like we are freaking missionaries, not mercenaries. And if people disagree with it, it's like, bring it on. Welcome to Bankless, where we explore the frontier of internet money and internet finance. This is Ryan Sean Adams. I'm here with David Hoffman, and we're here to help you become more bankless. Bitcoiners. Oh, oh, is that what we're doing, David? <laughs> yeah, it's a Bitcoin uh, really, episode. This is a really simple premise for today's episode. We brought on somebody who could answer the question for us, for me. I had more of the questions, actually, than you, David, coming to this episode. Are Bitcoin layer twos real? What do you, you mean actually... by what do you mean by that question? Uh, what does that, that mean? That's kind of what I was uh, going to ask our guests and did ask our guests. But what I what I sort of mean is I was under the impression that Bitcoin did not have the expressivity, did not have the virtual machine, was more like a calculator and not a computer mm -hmm. at its base layer, and therefore had a very difficult, if impossible, probably impossible time launching what Ethereum calls a roll-up which right. is you know, some sort of chain that is secured by the base chain. And uh, this next guest says, actually, layer twos are possible on Bitcoin. With an asterisk. With, with an, an asterisk. asterisk. And he explains yeah. why. So I thought it was a, a brilliant um, like episode. And it doesn't answer all of my questions, but opens the door to possibility that mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't know fully existed. And so I've still some research to do on this. This is probably the first episode of several in the future where we explore this topic in more depth. But I don't know, this this guest uh, has some legitimacy on this topic. And actually, you know this person, right? Yeah. And so he came in my Twitter DMs and I was like, or my, my tweets and I was just like, David, who is this? This is a good answer. You had already met him in person. Yeah. This is this is your, basically how your my relationship is. Is like you who are who is this person? I'm yeah, like, oh yeah, I met I met this person that one time. Yeah, um, yeah uh, I, I, I we'll talk about a little bit of the intro how, like how we met David in, in in the show. Shout out Stephen from uh, Alpha Alpha. Um, one thing I want to say before we go into this episode is that when we talk about like the differences between layer ones, usually there are things that get lost in translation, especially when I do like some of these Solana episodes, like I have to like stop and just like translate uh, for the listeners who I know are like thinking in Ethereum terms. But across smart contract platforms, that's actually pretty easy to do and not all that complicated. It's just like usually swap out one word, replace it, replace it with a different word, right? It, and then there's like the conversation of like learning about Bitcoin versus Ethereum. And if like learning about Solana to Ethereum is like English to Spanish or something, learning about like Ethereum to Bitcoin is like English to Chinese. Like you can translate, it does work, but it's entirely different. And so when we talk about layer twos on Bitcoin and we talk about fraud proofs and we talk about different things, like, yes, we are close, but like we need to actually... Some things don't always carry over. And so I think that's important context for listeners to go in. It's like you don't just swap one thing out with a one word and, and place it with a Bitcoin word. That's not how it works. Uh, and so like layer twos and fraud proofs and ZK rollups and like expressivity on Bitcoin will look different. It's like same, same, but different. And so you can't perfectly translate these things. And you'll li you'll listen to me and Ryan like stumble our way into that realization once again as we have this conversation with Bitcoin Dave. Yeah, there were there were some stumblings in this episode, but it's a uh, it's a pretty like we didn't have an agenda going in. We just yeah. wanted to pick curious, David yeah. C. Roy, who's our guest. Yeah. Uh, we call him Bitcoin David because we have two yeah. Davids in this episode. Mm -hmm. uh, pick his brain. I think uh, hopefully the result is something that can further your knowledge on what Bitcoin is building because there's kind of a renaissance going on a yeah. little bit, like some glimmers of it. It's a it, Dave Bitcoin Dave to Bitcoin David presents a zero to one moment in Bitcoin building. Wow, that absolutely. is potentially ahead to us. Super exciting. So guys, stay tuned for that. But before we get into this episode, we want to thank the sponsors that made it possible, including our recommended exchange, a place where you can buy Bitcoin. If you're you a can Bitcoiner, buy Bitcoin there, yeah. As crack it, go create an account. If you want a crypto trading experience backed by world-class security and award-winning support teams, then head over to Kraken, one of the longest standing and most secure crypto platforms in the world. Kraken is on a journey to build a more accessible, inclusive, and fair financial system, making it simple and secure for everyone, everywhere, to trade crypto. Kraken's intuitive trading tools are designed to grow with you, empowering you to make your first or your hundredth trade in just a few clicks. And there's an award-winning client support team available 24-7 
7 to help you along the way, along with a whole range of educational guides, articles, and videos. With products and features like Kraken Pro and Kraken NFT Marketplace and a seamless app to bring it all together, it's really the perfect place to get your complete crypto experience. So check out the simple, secure, and powerful way for everyone to trade crypto, whether you're a complete beginner or a seasoned pro. Go to kraken.com slash bankless to see what crypto can be. Not investment advice, crypto trading involves risk of loss. Arbitrum is the leading Ethereum scaling solution that is home to hundreds of decentralized applications. Arbitrum's technology allows you to interact with Ethereum at scale with low fees and faster transactions. Arbitrum has the leading DeFi ecosystem, strong infrastructure options, flourishing NFTs, and is quickly becoming the Web3 gaming hub. Explore the ecosystem at portal.arbitrum.io. Are you looking to permissionlessly launch your own Arbitrum Orbit chain? Arbitrum Orbit allows anyone to utilize Arbitrum's secure scaling technology to build your own Orbit chain, giving you access to interoperable, customizable permissions with dedicated throughput. Whether you are a developer, an enterprise, or a user, Arbitrum Orbit lets you take your project to new heights. All of these technologies leverage the security and decentralization of Ethereum. Experience Web3 development the way it was always meant to be. Secure, fast, cheap, and friction-free. Visit Arbitrum.io and get your journey started in one of the largest Ethereum communities. Celo is the mobile-first, EVM-compatible, carbon-negative blockchain built for the real world. Driving real-world use cases like mobile payments and mobile DeFi, and with Opera Minipay as one of the fastest-growing Web3 wallets, Celo is seeing a meteoric rise with over 300 million transactions and 1.5 million monthly active addresses. And now, Celo is looking to come home to Ethereum as a Layer 2. Optimism, Polygon, Matter Labs, and Arbitrum have all thrown their hats in the ring for the Celo Layer 2 to build upon their stacks. Why the competition? The Celo Layer 2 will bring huge advantages like a decentralized sequencer, off-chain data availability secured by Ethereum validators, and one block finality. What does that all mean for you? With Celo Layer 2, gas fees will stay low and you can even pay for gas natively using ERC20 tokens, sending crypto to phone numbers across wallets using Social Connect. But Celo is a community-governed protocol. This means that Celo needs you to weigh in and make your voice heard. Join the conversation in the Celo forums, follow Celo on Twitter, and visit Celo.org to shape the future of Ethereum. Bankless Nation, we are super excited to introduce you to David Seroy. Yes, we have a second David on the podcast today. This is the Bitcoin David. Bitcoin Dave. I guess yeah. my co-host, maybe uh, David. David uh, Hoffman, I should refer to you as Ethereum David. So we've got Ethereum Bitcoin David. David here, and he is a Bitcoin wizard, I would say. What does that mean? He is definitely an armchair researcher in the Bitcoin roll-up ecosystem. He loves Bitcoin and uh, loves projects that are building on Bitcoin. He actually had probably the best answer I received to a question about the Bitcoin roll-up community and L2 community I put out and is part of the reason for this podcast. Bitcoin David, welcome to Bankless. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited. I, I can't believe you guys let a Bitcoiner on here. Oh, 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 we do that we, from time we, to time. Yeah, we bring Bitcoiners oh, on. Yeah. Yeah. We just had... Um, Nick Carter yeah. is our number one most true, recurring true, guest. True, true, true. Yeah. yeah. Who yeah. else? Who else? Who is that? After, uh, after Vitalik. Month? After Vitalik Buterin. Then Nick Carter. David, who am I forgetting? Being in this month? Uh, uh, we've got um, got Eric Wall. Uh, Eric yeah. Wall, like on four yeah. or five times. No. You guys had, had Lynn on? We had Lynn Alden on like four, five times. We just had Robert Breedlove on That's for his first time. Robert Breedlove, yeah, yeah, yeah. of course. Of yeah, course. Yeah. Okay, fair Bitcoin enough. represents at least two to three percent of all bankless podcasts <laughs> that when you put it like that that's we, very small <laughs> we, we, we gotta pump those numbers up yeah it's undersized <laughs> as far as uh yeah mark yeah well that's what we're doing today so bitcoin david i understand actually you guys have met in person yes so yes. this isn't your first meeting so. I was in, we were introduced by uh, steven cesaro of the alpha alpha podcast fame uh, and David was introduced to me as Bitcoin Dave, and that's how his name is stuck in my brain. And once again, entering this uh, recording room, I was like, wait, David, are you called Bitcoin Dave, or is that just how Steven introduced you? And apparently that's just what Steven introduces yeah, him yeah, as. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now and it's stuck. We actually, we actually played pickleball the next day. And, yes, uh, then we played pickleball. David, yes. uh -huh. David told me about a really cool idea. He said he wants to put pickleballs on the blockchain. The supply chain is under duress, and yeah, it needs uh -huh. Ethereum. <laughs> Yeah, you but which to, we're track track points so no one can cheat with points. Well, on, but isn't that the broader market. question? Like which blockchain? Because uh, <laughs> now Bitcoin can support some tokens. I'm I'm hopeful, uh, Bitcoin Dave, you, you'll you'll tell us a little bit about this because may, maybe I'll start the conversation. We're going to talk about the broader Bitcoin ecosystem. But my base question in that tweet that you helped answer for me was was this? Okay, a question for the unbiased big brains. That's how I couch this. Can Bitcoin have an L2 roll up? that satisfies the five slices of the decentralization pie. I was referring to the L2 beat 
pie where there's like kind of five slices that demarcate uh, decentralization. I mean, is there an exit window? Do you have uh, some sort of decentralized sequencer, a few other things, or does it lack expressivity? And so, uh, David, I, I want to throw that that question to you, basically. So, can Bitcoin now support L two rollups? And like, what does what does that even mean uh, in in the context of Bitcoin? Yeah, well, I'm going to give a really clear answer here and say yes, but it depends. And really, it kind of depends on, I'd say, three general things. First is like, what flavor of rollup are we talking about? Are we talking about like a fully validating zk rollup? A sovereign rollup that has no proving system or an optimistic rollup. The second question is, you know, are we saying with the soft fork or without a soft fork? And then the third question is like, what level of trust is, is acceptable? And if we jump all the way to the answer that people probably care about is like, no, we want no soft forks. We want fully trustless and it needs to be a fully validating ZK or validity rollup. If that's the exact uh, criteria we need, then technically no. Bitcoin cannot do that. And that is because Bitcoin does not have the ability to natively verify zero knowledge or validity proofs on the base layer. Mm -hmm. Where this gets a little bit interesting is, is BitVM. And BitVM potentially allows us to hack in a ZKP verifier into the Bitcoin L1 without a soft fork. Um, and so BitVM was this white paper that, that, that Robin Linus, a, a developer, an amazing researcher in the Bitcoin community wrote back in mid-December. And that was about six weeks ago. And so the claim with BitVM is that we can now compute anything on Bitcoin and we can express Turing complete smart contracts on Bitcoin. And so if this is true, which it appears to be, then this is kind of the, the fundamental breakthrough that really changes the paradigm for, for what is possible on Bitcoin. The, the caveat with BitVM is that it's a little bit clunky and it has a trust assumption of one of n, meaning that you can perform this, this computation where we could have a ZKP verifier on the Bitcoin L1, but the people that are performing that computation could be a group of, you know, 10, 100, 1000 people. You only need one of them to be honest in order to kind of, uh, you know, get the, the crypto economic security there. And, you know, some people would say, well, that's, that's, that's not good enough. But, but if we can, um, you know, essentially optimistically create a validity, uh, prover, then maybe that's good enough to, to, to build the bridge. And I mean that technically building a bridge, but also metaphorically building a bridge to cross that chasm that Bitcoin typically can't cross. And if you can cross that chasm, then you get into the whole world that that Ethereum is in. You get into this idea of like shared sequencers and cross composability and pre confirmations and tons of different execution environments, like, like some really truly amazing stuff. So, so BitVM is the real innovation that this could possibly happen without a soft fork in a little bit of a hacky way. And that may be good enough to, to, to kind of build out the rest of this. And maybe down the line, we say, okay, like we want the fully trustless version. We're going to soft fork in, uh, you know, a dedicated ZKP verifier. Okay, so I, I want to get back to like bit bit um, bit VM as kind of maybe part of the the final destination here. But could could we zoom out for just a minute before yeah. we get into some of these these more technical details? So where is this innovation coming from in Bitcoin? Like why has Bitcoin just discovered that? Oh wow, we can we can uh, launch rollups and and layer twos on, on top of Bitcoin. Like is this some kind of a builder renaissance? Has this always been possible? It's just there wasn't the the funding or the projects. Or is this just kind of new novel experimentation? Are they seeing the success of Ethereum? They're just like, hey, we could just do that here. Where, where's this renaissance coming from? Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of moving puzzle pieces here. Like, to be clear, like, like a lot of this stuff was kind of discussed like early on in Bitcoin talk forums. Like there's a post from Greg Maxwell, who's like kind of this like OG, just like amazing Bitcoin developer where he, he talks about bringing, you know, ZKPs uh, to Bitcoin. And he specifically references Ellie Ben Sasan, who is now like, you know, who was the founder and is now the CEO of like Starkware. So, so this has always kind of been on, on Bitcoin's radar. And there's even quotes from Satoshi where he, he talks about, you know, like, like if there, the technology has caught up, like this would be, you know, the best way to, to, to improve and kind of like scale Bitcoin. Like all the, the, the evidence is there. Where this really kind of starts, in my opinion, is like back in 20, or not, not starts, but like, you know, is back in 2014 where Blockstream released their their white paper for sidechains. And this was like this, this scaling vision for Bitcoin, where it's like, you're gonna have the Bitcoin base layer and then you're gonna have all these side chains. You know, maybe you have a big block side chain, maybe you have a privacy side chain, you know, maybe you have like whatever other specialties. 
And everybody loved this vision, but it was the, the, the one problem is the blockstream white paper said, Oh, by the way, like we haven't solved this trustless two way peg. Like, so for now, you're just going to have this federated model where you bridge your Bitcoin into these other ecosystems. You'll trust us with a multi sig. We'll solve the, the trustless two way peg later. That never happened. And in the interim, Bitcoin went down the path of like lightning network. You know, they got Segwit in, you know, it fixed the transaction malleability, which was an issue that prevented lightning from, from occurring. All that happened with the block size wars in 2017. And then we said, we're going to go all in on, on essentially lightning. While that was happening, as you guys know, like the Ethereum community went down this other path where you said, you know, we're going to pursue, uh, you know, plasma and then state channels. And then you eventually settled on rollups. What we're now seeing in the Bitcoin community, in my opinion, is that lightning is, is, is massively hindered. And I, I think people huh. drastically overestimate essentially what it can do. And don't get me wrong. I love the Lightning community. I support the builders, but there are some systemic issues, which in my opinion are probably going to be insurmountable for it to truly scale Bitcoin. And Ben Carmen, uh, he goes by Ben the Carmen on Twitter, really wrote like this, this very nice, uh, like post where he kind of said, like, he's like, I'm a, a Lightning lover. He's like, I am one of the developers. He goes, but sometimes I look around and be like, what are we doing? Like, like, is this really the right path for, for Bitcoin to scale? And he labeled that, he, he laid out like all these reasons why lightning, like it, it, ha it has some issues, you know? And, you know, I, I think a lot of those issues are going to be tough to get past. And even if we do get past them, it's just like, you know, it, it doesn't have a global state. You're going to have the inbound liquidity issues. It doesn't have very good privacy, you, you, you know, like, it, it, it requires massive footprints on the L1 is an issue, you know? So like if, if Ryan and I want to open up a channel, like that requires an on-chain transaction, you know, if you want to add more liquidity in this channel, that requires an on-chain transaction. So, so David, just, just to kind of get up to, to this point, and it, it sounds like there's been some eras of, of Bitcoin uh, development, right? So like Bitcoin had kind of its side chain era, let, let's say, and that never manifested into kind of like a true trustless bridge and something that like in uh, Ethereum would call more like a, a roll up. And that was one area. And then lightning was kind of the thing. I mean, uh, Ethereum, you rightly pointed out, very much had its kind of state channel era where we thought that would be like the holy grail for Ethereum. And we tried a lot in that era. I mean, like, uh, remember Amin Soleimani, you know, built his entire company spank chain on like right. on top of that. And we had Raiden and that was sort of like this, and, and it never achieved product market fit. It never got the traction. I think for the same reasons that the, the Bitcoin community is, is seeing, um, like, you know, it's endeavor inside of state channels th through lightning. It's like some of the same, uh, things st still applied. Right. And then we entered kind of this, this roll up era of Ethereum. And then so much so that Ethereum essentially pivoted entire, its entire roadmap to be like, you know, Vitalik mm -hmm. called it the, ro the roll up centric roadmap. Right. So yeah. are, you're saying this, the similar, um, trajectory, the similar path is happening just like slower and a little delayed, but like, it's still, ha it's happening in the same way in the, the Bitcoin community or, or is it, you know, is there something I'm missing here? No, I mean, that's, that's exactly right. Um, I think one of the things that that was kind of the breaking point was like a lot of the ordinals and inscription stuff, because, you know, inscriptions, they, they post arbitrary data on chain and some people will call that spam and it's not monetary use cases and all of that. But bottom line, like, like they are fee paying customers. And so they are kind of pushing up fees on the Bitcoin L1 chain in the same way that like Ethereum kind of had like their fee crisis and, and, and fees were booming, like fees on Bitcoin. They're not like absurd, but like they're, they're creeping up. And what people are finding is that like the lightning network really suffers in a high fee environment and people are sitting there and looking and saying like, wait, like this security budget that Bitcoin has, like we're relying on fees to be higher long-term, but our long-term scaling solution lightning doesn't really work in a high fee environment. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think that was the catalyst that kind of was making people question like, okay, like, is this the long-term solution? And we have other things like, like arc, which is very cool. You know, people are working on things kind of like, like, you know, RGB as well. And, you know, uh, space chains and, and all this stuff. But like at the end of the day, nothing has solved like the trustless two way peg, but rollups mm -hmm. potentially do. I want to present actually a slightly a different um, characterization of the progress of Ethereum scalability as it compares to the Bitcoin story. Um, because we had, we had the Ethereum layer one, but we knew it was always needing to scale beyond that. And so that we started with state channels, which then grew into like generalized state channels, which then grew into like plasma for hyperscale. 
and we were doing like these plasma thing for a really long time. We had these plasma implementers calls. And then there was like this aha eureka moment, which morphed into optimistic rollups. Um, and we had like the Unipig demo and then that's how we got to like optimistic rollups. Uh, and then also we knew that ZK rollups would ultimately manifest as a result of that. And it was a very logical progression of thought of like research and development and direction and iteration and until like it actually landed on where we are today. Would, would you say, David, it's kind of like an idea maze? like kind of quest like we hit some dead ends and we're yeah. like oh like back up and like, but smaller dead ends sure. right and like the, and then we kept on progressing each one built on the history of the other and what i'm seeing in bitcoin is actually people going down the lightning idea maze realizing that it's a pretty strong pretty far like tons of investment into lightning network and realizing it's a pretty strong dead end and now we're actually going very far back and picking an entirely new strategy for Bitcoin expressivity and Bitcoin scalability. David, yeah. would you, how would you, that's kind of my, how I would kind of change that characterization. I, would you agree? I do want to somewhat defend the Lightning community. Like, I don't okay. think it's, it's, it's a dead end, but I think that it has like significant limitations that can't be overcome by just like, just give it enough dev time. People are like, oh, the builders are building. It's like, no, like, and Vitalik pointed this out. It's like, like the layer two, like, like lightning is essentially bound by essentially what the L1 is capable of. And so there, there, there there's just systemic limitations that, that, that lightning is going to have. Like, could it be something that kind of like connects all these different layers? Like if you have a bunch of rollups or, um, you know, like something like fediments and can it connect these fediments? Like, like, yes, but, but is it going to be this grand vision that everybody hoped for? Like, no, uh, that doesn't mean we abandon it. It just means like, let's let a thousand flowers bloom. David, uh, uh, Bitcoin David, I should say. So I, you know, I, I'm wondering if the Bitcoin community has kind of like felt this because I'm not sure if if you would represent yourself as sort of a, a minority of folks. I know there's been kind of like uh, the Nick uh, Carter Udi sort of wizards is sort of side of things, and there's almost been this. Um, like this forking in the social layer of Bitcoin of kind of builders and those who just want the, just the pure gold store of value uh, use case. But it also seems to me like some of the people who uh, were embracing of like some sort of scale, scaling of, uh, you know, trustless transactions per second. Um, and they were formerly Bitcoiners. Like I count myself, you know, among those already moved to the Ethereum community. I, I'm wondering if you think that uh, effect is in play too. So like I consider myself a Bitcoiner. I love Bitcoin. I still own Bitcoin. I, I don't know if some Bitcoiners in kind of like the, the Bitcoin tribe would acknowledge me as a Bitcoiner, but I consider myself a Bitcoiner. That said, I moved over to Ethereum because they had a roadmap that was actually trying to st scale this whole um, trustless compute piece of it. And um, yes, in the early days, the monetary properties weren't you know quite as pristine. Uh, it doesn't have kind of the the anonymous faceless founder, but I saw this potential to build kind of a bankless money system. And that's why I moved over into the Ethereum community because they were pursuing that most aggressively. But you're saying, I think what you're saying is there are still some Bitcoiners out there who are trying to build this vision on top of Bitcoin. And w one of my basic questions is like, but why? Why not just why not do it on uh, Ethereum or like why have you stayed? You you seem like you're very much the builder mindset. Why have you stayed like inside of uh, the the Bitcoin community and wh why do you still have hopes and aspirations there? You know when I talk to a lot of Bitcoiners like and it kind of gets into this like implicit discussion of like Bitcoin versus Ethereum. They're like they're like well you know this is a monetary revolution like not a technology revolution. And that used to bother me so much because I'm like yes it's it, it's a monetary revolution but but damn it, like the tech matters, you know? And, and and there were many times where I would listen to Bankless episodes and I'm like, man, this stuff is freaking exciting and it's cool. But I always had this, 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 this spot in my heart for Bitcoin because like, like that, that is the use case. Like, like it is all about the money. And, and if we can kind of merge these, the, these two worlds, like that is the best case scenario. And now that we see some of this technical stuff that Ethereum has pioneered and we could potentially bring it to Bitcoin, like that is the vision that I want. I do not think that Ethereum is as good of money as Bitcoin. You know, I could sit here and kind of stay silent and be like, but damn, like Ethereum has legit scaling solutions. I can honestly say that I do not think it is as good of money. And I think what you guys are starting to realize right now is that like, like, like scaling, block space, composability, all that stuff's going to be solved. But where are the apps? Where are the freaking apps? Like what is going to be the use? The use, it, it, it's, it's been the same since day one. It's money. It's payments. It's payments to each other. It's payments in private. It's payments to, you know, uh, like a, a loan contract. It's payments against, you know, collateral. It's, it's, 
you know, payments if you want to send it, you know, using Face ID on, 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 on Apple Pay. Like, like it's always been payments and it's always been money. And like Bitcoin maximalists for, for all of their flaws and, and for all the frankly, like dumb things they say, what they got right is, is the monetary revolution. And even after this episode, I think so many of them, like, I hope will listen to this and they'll probably still be blind to roll ups and the power of them, but them holding their ground and, and, and having that anchor and understanding that, that, the tech, in my opinion, is kind of irrelevant unless you have the money like that part they got right. And that's why I'm sympathetic to, to the Bitcoin camp like that, in my opinion, is the true revolution. But ultimately, if you want that revolution, you, you, you need to have the technical side like Bitcoin in its current condition. You know, you really can only scale to like, you know, less than one percent of the world in self-custody like that is not viable. You know, we, we, we need to like increase the, the, the scaling of self custody. We need to bring some form of expressivity so people can borrow against their Bitcoin. They don't have to sell it so that people can have private transactions. We need it. So, uh, David, I'm going to ask you because, you know, we've certainly made the case for uh, bankless um, money systems on, built on top of uh, Bitcoin. And uh, it seemed to be a roadblock in the past. I'm wondering if you could kind of like, what would you say to the Bitcoin community? I mean, you sell them, sell them, pitch them on rollups. Why should the Bitcoin community get excited about rollups? This whole vision that we have about like 21 million, 21 million is thrown out the window. If, if anybody can't have the optionality to self custody, like right now, there's only a certain allotment of block space every single 10 minutes. If Bitcoin gets any modicum of scale, you know, those blocks are, are, are essentially going to be full and it's going to price out every single other person from having self custody. If everyone is using these custodial solutions, they don't have the option to go into layer one, then that in and of itself leads to massive uh, attack surface for fractional reserve lending, for rehypothecation to to kind of like like basically the block fives and Celsius's of the world. Yeah. I mean, just anything, e e e even, you know, putting your funds in, in into a, a custodial lightning node, like like it gives this attack vector to to implicitly break the the, the, the 21 million. And that's what essentially people care about and you know seeing kind of like the, the the decentralized finance movement like the DeFi movement in in ethereum i think bitcoin is like massively underestimate this like even if you think you know finance is the scum of the earth and you're this kind of like rothbardian you know austrian economist like finance is the anchor that money must carry you know if if if, if we want this perfect world like you need the ability to 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 audit these kind of contracts like people are going to borrow they're going to lend there's going to be all this stuff like if you can audit all of that and you can you know cryptographically like enforce this set of rules like all of that contributes to this you know trustless you know hard money world mantle formerly known as bitdao is the first dao led web3 ecosystem all built on top of mantle's first core product the mantle network a brand new high performance ethereum layer 2 built using the op stack but uses eigenlayer's data availability solution instead of the expensive ethereum layer 1 not only does this reduce mantle network's gas fees by 80 percent but it also reduces gas fee volatility providing a more stable foundation for mantle's applications the mantle treasury is one of the biggest dao owned treasuries which is seeding an ecosystem of projects from all around the Web3 space for Mantle. Mantle already has sub-communities from around Web3 onboarded, like Game7 for Web3 Gaming and Bybit for TVL and Liquidity and OnRamps. So if you want to build on the Mantle network, Mantle is offering a grants program that provides milestone-based funding to promising projects that help expand, secure, and decentralize Mantle. If you want to get started working with the first DAO-led Layer 2 ecosystem, check out Mantle at mantle.xyz and follow them on Twitter at 0xMantle. Are you launching a token? Is it already live? How are you managing the legal and tax obligations for providing token grants to your team? It's no secret that token management gets complicated. Between learning all the legal language and tax obligations in every country that your team is in, token grant management can feel like an obstacle course, but it doesn't have to. That's where Toku steps in. Toku provides practical tools to handle token grants, allowing for effective oversight of token distributions and payroll tax compliance for employees, contractors, advisors, and investors. They also handle tax withholding through their real-time tax calculations that can be done by Toku or integrated into any payroll EOR providers in any jurisdiction. Toku is a trusted provider of Protocol Labs, DYDX Foundation, Mina Protocol, and many more. Get started for free and make token compensation simple at toku.com slash bankless. It's everyone's favorite season in crypto, tax season. And crypto tax is always an absolute headache, especially for all you DGENs out there. But it doesn't have to be a nightmare. That's where Crypto Tax Calculator comes in. The software 
were built for DGENs by DGENs. As Coinbase's official global tax partner, Crypto Tax Calculator focuses on making complex transactions into easy ones, supporting over 300,000 currencies across Ethereum, Arbitrum, Optimism, as well as a thousand other integrations as well. It's as simple as connecting your wallet, pulling in all your transactions, and following the automated suggestions to quickly and accurately calculate your tax obligations. Plus, for all the airdrop farmers out there, Crypto Tax Calculator has your back as they are consistently adding support for new and upcoming layer ones, layer twos, and all the airdrops that you're currently farming. 2024 is the year when the DGENs do their crypto taxes with speed and confidence. Make taxes this year easy and affordable with Crypto Tax Calculator. Sign up at CryptoTaxCalculator.io and get a 30% discount with code BANK30. Click the link in the show notes for more information. Okay, so in the beginning of this episode, we I, I started with kind of like a, a question that brought us into the weeds really quick, and you started talking about um, BitVM, right? Which which is the question of like, can Bitcoin really you know launch rollups, uh, completely decentralized Ethereum style uh, rollups? And uh, you threw out a, kind of a, a few categories and, and definitions there, but before the BitVM thing. Uh, that you're talking about, which we can still get into a little bit more. What has traditionally been possible uh, on top of Bitcoin? Because where I sort of last left things, uh, it seemed to me that Bitcoin did not have the expressivity to sort of do much more than some sort of a side chain, multi-sig side chain, right? And it, yeah, it was kind of like the like the early days where where things maybe left off. But you mentioned sovereign rollups. You know, to me, that's kind of like I think that's sort of a, a side chain type of thing. So, what sort of thing has been possible when um, Bitcoin talks about layer twos, or the community talks about rollups? What are they describing? I guess outside of BitVM, which is maybe a special case that that we'll get into in in a minute. I mean, the main problem with with with, with Bitcoin is that it has no no concept of the outside world, right? Like if you are on a side chain, like the side chain can can run a Bitcoin node, it can interpret essentially what's happening on on, on Bitcoin, but Bitcoin cannot interpret what's happening on the, these other side chains. So so you can bridge Bitcoin out of the ecosystem because those other chains, those other ecosystems can read Bitcoin. But if you're trying to bring Bitcoin back into the ecosystem, Bitcoin has no idea what happened in that outside world. And so that's 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 the main problem. It's it, it's essentially just a trustless two way peg. Like if you want to peg your Bitcoin, you know, outside into a side chain, you can't do it because of that. And zero knowledge proofs could potentially solve that. So what I could do is kind of give like an overview of of you know how Bitcoin rollups would work uh, from a Bitcoiner perspective. But I can start using some like Ethereum vernacular and vocabulary. That'd and I think that would be very that, helpful. That'd be very helpful. And and as far as I understand, so like an optimistic rollup would not be possible on uh, Bitcoin, right? Because we don't have a smart, smart contract that can kind of enforce the sort of the, the fraud proof type of game, but maybe there's hope for some sort of a ZK rollup. Is that what you're saying? Well, BitVM potentially could, could enable both of those in like a kind of like, uh, you know, quasi trust minimized way. And I'll get to that, but let me describe the, the, the rollups first that we're all, we're all on the same page. Um, so in the Ethereum world, you guys have talked a lot about this modular thesis, right? How you have like the data, the computation and the settlement and Bitcoin is really no different. When a user submits uh, a Bitcoin transaction, like Alice sends one Bitcoin to Bob, that is data that goes up into the mempool, which is like the waiting room, right? The miners mine the block and then they go up into the waiting room, up into the mempool, they pull it down, they collect the transaction fee and then they, they create the block. They package all of those transactions, that data into the block. That block then gets propagated out to the rest of the network. It's sent to all the nodes. And if you're being a good little Bitcoiner, you're running your node, you receive that block and you're going through and you're you're essentially performing the computation. You're, you're validating all of those transactions. You're saying, does Alice actually have one Bitcoin? You know, is this a valid signature? Okay, yes. And then they append that block to the rest of the prior blocks in the blockchain. And then now you've essentially audited, you know, everything up into that date. And then you settle the transaction. You say, all right, Alice no longer has one Bitcoin. You know, uh, Bob has it. With a roll up in a Bitcoin world, similar to Ethereum, you're abstracting that computation part, that kind of incrementing and decrementing of the balances is no longer being done by your nodes. It's being done in this off chain environment. Right. And. You know, I think an astute Bitcoiner at this point will say, well, hold on a second. Actually, let me back up really quick. Because you're not doing the, the computation on Bitcoin anymore, you're doing this off-chain environment, you can use any custom execution environment you want. You're no longer bound by what is called Bitcoin script, which is kind of like the EVM equivalent in the Bitcoin world. 
you can now use EVM in this off-chain computation world. You could use Cairo, you could use Rust, you could use Clarity, you could use whatever language you want. At this point, you know, a Bitcoiner would say, well, hold on a second. If this computation, this kind of incrementing of decrementing of these balances is happening off-chain and my node is not validating all of that, then, then doesn't that defeat the whole purpose of, of Bitcoin? And this is where, as you guys know, like the zero knowledge proof comes in, where all of that computation, which it could have been smart contracts and DeFi and NFTs or, you know, fast transactions, small transactions, all of that is essentially compressed into a singular zero knowledge proof, which is like an unforgeable digital receipt. That unforgeable digital receipt is pushed back to Bitcoin L1, along with the updated state saying, hey, you know, Alice no longer has that one Bitcoin. Now Bob has it. Here's the unforgeable digital proof that this actually occurred. And from Bitcoin's perspective, it's, it, it, it's essentially saying, well, I have no idea what, what, what happened off chain, but just prove to me, mathematically prove to me that, that you followed the rules of my consensus, that no more than 21 million coins were, were, were created, that, that Alice actually did have the funds, that all of the signatures were valid. And if you can mathematically prove that to me, then I will allow you to update the state on the L1, meaning I will allow the kind of, now, uh, you know, Bob has the one Bitcoin and Alice no longer does. Functionally, the way this kind of works on, on Bitcoin is on the L1, you would have what's called like a shared UTXO. This is essentially like the roll-up contract in Ethereum world, where users can pool their funds into the shared UTXO, and then those funds are represented in the L2, where all this computation and the zero-knowledge proof and everything is essentially completed. It was typically assumed that in order to create some sort of shared UTXO structure, you would need a software called Recursive Covenants. However, there are proposals to potentially create something like this if you had a ZKP verifier. With BitVM, we now potentially have the ZKP verifier. So hopefully that's making sense where we could potentially create these shared UTXOs on the L1. We can perform all the computation in the ZK proof and submit it back to the L1. And then you can use BitVM to verify that ZK proof. If you have that, then you can build a rollup. All right. So before we get to a bit VM, could, could you just like so I'm not as familiar with the kind of the the Bitcoin. I'll call it generally layer two community, mm -hmm. but like I don't know if these are legit layer twos or not, right? And what what you would say? And I, I'll say first, like we run across the same problem, uh, of course, in all of crypto and in Ethereum, where everybody wants to be a layer two, but oftentimes they're just side chains with multi six, yeah. and so it's hard to like get past the marketing speak and get to actually the technical details of is this really a layer two? And then that's even more obscured by the fact that some legitimate layer two projects are still not fully layer two, if that makes sense. Like they still have some uh, training wheels on, some guardrails on, and they're working to decentralize over time. But the technology is such that they can become kind of fully decentralized or much more decentralized layer twos in the future. So I'm just trying to find out what's real in the Bitcoin kind of quote unquote layer two community. So something like Stacks, is that a layer two? Something like Rootstock, is that a layer two? Are these kind of like more like side chain types of networks. I mean, they're they're more like side chains. There's kind of multi sigs, or they don't like necessarily anchor to Bitcoin. Like, do quasi call them like like layer twos? And I, I I guess they are. But for me personally, it's like no, like I want like this path towards like fully trustless like zk rollups. And the closest thing we could possibly get there is like some sort of integration with 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 BitVM. You know. Okay. So aside from Bit BitVM, are there any sort of layer twos and you know like in the theorem definition of a, a layer two is basically it has to be kind of secured settled by the base layer or be on a trajectory towards being fully decentralized is there anything else besides bitvm yeah i mean in terms of like the the level of trust that you guys would want the only thing is lightning network Got lightning it. network from a right. security assumption standpoint is like very very strong but it just comes with like so many other pitfalls right. okay okay so we've been talking so much, like you've been uh, alluding to this BitVM project, like, what is it? Where did it come from? Uh, like, why are you so excited about it? Uh, you don't work for the project. So I think you're looking at this from a, you know, a Bitcoiner that's very excited about this, this building renaissance. And you're just kind of evaluating this and you're like, this is the future. But uh, yeah, give us some context for this. What is, what is it? Yeah, so BitVM is a way to to verify any arbitrarily complex, like Turing complete, uh, you know, contract on Bitcoin. And the keyword there is, is verify, not necessarily execute. And so if you read the BitVM white paper, there are, are, are two key references in there. The first is optimistic rollups. 
And the second is Taproot, which was the last Bitcoin soft fork. So as you guys know, uh, you know, an optimistic rollup performs this computation off chain, and then it, it, it submits the results of that computation back on chain along with the data. And you optimistically assume that it is valid. And if somebody says, Hey, I do not believe this is valid. I believe that you lied. Then they can use the data that was posted on L1 to create a fraud proof and say, Hey, this is incorrect. And then the transactions are essentially rewound. So worst case, the transaction get rewound, the fraud gets discovered. But because of the game theory, you assume that it's going to, to work correctly. BidVM is similar, um, except it's not actually posting transaction data on L1. Instead, what it's, what it's doing is it's, it's committing on chain in a Bitcoin transaction to perform a certain set of computations. And it will do this off chain. And it says, uh, you know, I will perform all of this computation and then it will do it off chain in, in kind of a prover verify setup where there is a prover that's performing this off chain. And then if they do not perform that computation, then the verifier can take a piece of that and, and submit it to the Bitcoin L1 and say, hey, here is fraud. They didn't follow this computation. And the prover, just like an optimistic rollup, essentially gets slashed. The way that this works, because Bitcoin can't, doesn't have any sort of scripting language and it can't like verify these kind of like, like, like complex, uh, you know, programming languages is, is interesting. So most programming languages, I think pretty much all of them, like for example, like take Python is built in a hierarchical manner where Python was built on top of like C++, which was, you know, an extension of C, which was built on assembly. And it goes all the way down to kind of the, the, the circuits or the binary bits where literally if you have two wires and they're going into what's called like a gateway, if two of those wires have electricity pulsing through them, maybe the gateway lights up. Maybe for other types of gateways, if one wire is on, one wire is off, the gateway lights up. The point is, is that, that these small little electrical signals in these gateways create the basis for like zeros and ones in binary language. And then that binary language, it becomes the basis for, you know, letters and further numbers and then all these codes. So what BitGM is doing is it could take some sort of code, say like a ZKP verifier, and it will break it down to its fundamental components down to those little binary gates. And then it will commit all those binary gates into what's called like a taproot tree, which this is a Merkle tree. So if you imagine like, you know, an upside down, uh, um, yeah, or just kind of like a pyramid structure where you have like the root and then you have all the binary trees. Like you would have this massive tree that has all the different chunks of, of, of this essentially code. And you can embed that into a Bitcoin transaction. And so in this uh, situation, again, like the prover is putting money at stake and they're saying, I will compute all of this, uh, like the ZKP verifier off chain. And if you feel that I am lying, then you can submit a single small transaction uh, as part of one of the, these taproot trees or part of this Merkle tree. And you can identify that as fraud. And if I'm found to be fraudulent, then you can slash and take my funds. So you could have a situation where you have one prover, you have a thousand different verifiers, and you yourself could be one of the verifiers. And what this essentially allows is um, you're optimistically creating a ZK verifier, if that makes sense. I think it does. I think it does. I'm going to have to like do some, you know, uh, more, more research on this myself and, uh, ask some other folks, but wait, let me ask you that the BitVM project, how close is it to, to mainnet? Is this kind of, this is beyond the white paper, but is that even the right question to ask? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I follow a lot of the telegram chats pretty closely. It, it, it seems like they're making progress. Like I don't want to hold them to anything, but like, I think you know, I, I think we could be looking at this stuff like within a year or less. Is, is mainnet like the right phrasing for this or is there a more precise word? Mm, I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not sure what we would call it. Well, there sure. would have to be some chain that I can interact with that is some sort of like, um, you know, virtual machine type chain, whether it's EVM or, or something else well, that ultimately settles to, to Bitcoin. It, or is that not what uh, like you're describing here, David? So, I mean, all of this, this computation for BitVM, it's happening off chain. It's happening just like, you know, on a server mm -hmm. or a computer or, 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 or anything. Like you, you don't need any sort of blockchain because again, you're kind of like optimistically assuming that this, uh, stuff, stuff is being done. So you're, you're saying, look, like here's, um, how do I want to say this? Like here's all this code that I'm essentially going to run. Like before you run it, you say, here's all this code that, that I am promising you I'm going to run. And you're breaking that down all into the binary parts and you're submitting that into the Bitcoin blockchain. You're, you're committing to it. You're basically saying, I am committing, you know, 10 Bitcoin 
that I'm going to run and operate this code off chain. And so what's happening off chain is the prover is running it and the verifier is simultaneously verifying. All this is, is outside of a blockchain. This little game that they're, they're, they're playing, there's, there's a lot of kind of interactivity that's happening between these parties. But if the verifier discovers and says, hey, you're being dishonest, they can go through and they can arbitrate that on the Bitcoin chain and be like, hey, do you remember you committed 10 Bitcoin to, to, to execute this? You, you committed and you promised that you would execute it this way. And I'm now providing a fraud proof to the Bitcoin chain proving that you did not follow the, 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 the code. And that's how they, they essentially punish or slash the, the off-chain computation. David, does this sound a little bit like Nibra to you? I'm not sure In what Nibra the, is. The Nibra project? That we've yeah, talked that's about. That's, a question that's, to a, you, that's, a, that's a proof aggregation layer. Um, no, I don't think so. Like, I think th what I'm trying to get my head wrapped around is like, because with like Arbitrum and Optimism, you and I are very used to like blockchain, like alternative blockchain networks that are blockchains mm -hmm. that settle down to Ethereum. Yes. And it's another entire like parallel system. And I don't think that's what's going on here. It's not a blockchain, right? It's um, like exploring like the world of like expressive layers on top of Bitcoin. You can't really like take your Ethereum frame of mind and apply it to Bitcoin. You can start there, but the outcome is completely different. And, and so like there's just like some things that don't cross over the chasm in terms of what they look like on Ethereum when they're applied to Bitcoin. It's just like a different construction. Like, um, for example, David, like the nature of the computation that would occur in a bit VM like layer two, it's not going to be like um, like NFT trading on a layer two or or maybe it maybe it is. But even if it is, it's going to look different. Right. Like it can maybe you can help uh, continue this conversation. Like what, what would, how is the different nature of like layer two computation going to be like on Bitcoin? Uh, well, well I, I guess I just want to like to, to maybe help this like. Uh, I think Ryan's like having trouble thinking that this is like this off-chain computation on a blockchain. And I'm thinking like in the context mm -hmm. of rollups, like like a prover is not a blockchain. Like you have this this right. you have this blockchain, but then you're you're taking all that and you're putting it in this like hyper centralized, just like like prover computer. And and that's that's kind of what's happening, uh, you know, on the bit VM side. It's not a blockchain whatsoever. You're performing it all off chain, which just means on a separate computer. Okay, so BitVM is more a prover. It's not an entire chain, but like you could just um, use the prover to validate the entire chain, right? Mm -hmm. Are layer twos on Bitcoin's blockchains? Yes, yes. So what BitVM is really focuses on is the bridge to get you to this L2 right. blockchain. Um, right. So like, like there, there, there really be two uh, different ways that that I think people envision using using BitVM. One is like that traditional rollup setup that that we talked about where you have the l1 contract you have the l2 blockchain it compresses the computation of zk proof and then there has to be something to receive and, and verify that zk proof so that little bridge component right there that that exists or can be arbitrated by the l1 to verify the zk proof like that is one use case of bitvm and you could build a a, a true or kind of like a like a more traditional zk rollup that way the other way that people could use BitVM is just to build like like a, a Bitcoin bridge. Like instead of using WBTC or a federation, like you could bridge Bitcoin, say, into some sort of wrapped Ethereum ecosystem, or you could bridge it into another side chain. And it has that same trust assumptions where you only need to trust one honest party out of, say, this, a thousand as opposed to a federation, and you can bridge it into another chain. And maybe that chain, you then build rollups on top of that. You have a settlement layer. You have, you know, 20 different rollups. They're all using the same ZK circuit. You're getting the cross composability, you know, all the kind of advanced topics that you guys are talking about. Like that's the potential for it. So to recap that, you could, you could create a ZKP verifier that's arbitrated by, by Bitcoin and just have a rollup that settles directly onto the Bitcoin L1. Or you can create a, a pegged version of Bitcoin with the same trust assumptions. And then in that new ecosystem, you could build rollups on top of that. It sounds okay. So it sounds like the emphasis that you're trying to place on is that this is a bridge primitive. But what is on the other side of that bridge? You know, Bitcoin's on one side of the bridge. What's on the other side of the bridge? What's on the other side of the bridge could be a whole like open field of innovation where it could be a blockchain, it could be like a, a tokenized impl implementation of Bitcoin elsewhere. It sounds like like it's up to developers to imagine what could be once on the other side of that bridge, once we have that bridge standard developed by the BitVM team. Is that, 
Is that fair? Yeah, exactly. And that's why I think, you know, I started off this conversation describing that, that idea of like the chasm, right? Like you're crossing the chasm and mm. where, where I mentioned that like bridge that we're building, both like a technical bridge and like a metaphorical bridge. And if you, right. if, uh. if you're willing to, to trust that bridge, this one of end trust assumption, this kind of like mm -hmm. optimistic as opposed to validity proof type, type setup. And if you can cross that bridge and you can cross that chasm, then you are into the new frontier, right? And, and could you build a bridge to Ethereum? And everybody's like, well, hey, we don't want any of this stuff on, on Bitcoin. Like we just want like a trust minimized way to use Bitcoin on Ethereum. Like maybe that's the route some people go. And maybe some people say, no, I want true roll up mm -hmm. where you're posting the data directly on Bitcoin. Maybe other people say we want this, this settlement layer where we have this world of different roll ups that are all cross composing with each other. Yeah, like like BitVM enab like enables this kind of design flexibility. Again, with that caveat right. of the one of n trust assumption. Yeah, I guess more more my question was why don't they just attach a chain to it then? If they're doing the work of creating the bridge. Like, this is essentially what um, Arbitrum or Optimism have like done is they've done the kind of the bridge piece, but then they've also just slapped a chain on it too. Uh, is, it, is that out of scope for BitVM? I think for the BitVM team, it's it's probably out of scope, but there are a lot of people who are very excited about using BitVM for that exact use case where, where they want to, to, to use it as a bridge to their chain. And there are some people that are doing the, the traditional roll-up path and there are other people that are using it for like side chains. Um, but yeah, like I, I don't think Robin and the BitVM team is, is building a chain themselves. Like they kind of want to let a thousand flowers bloom. Like Robin is on record right. saying, you know, a, a world of like, you know, an arbitrary amount of like side chains, all with different experimentations, like a free market of side chains is kind of his vision. Right. Yes. Okay. The the bridge, the metaphorical bridge that you're talking about, is landing way harder for me now. It's like when, once you get over this this the literal once you build the literal bridge, you get into the land of just like, hey, what's on the other side of that bridge? What's on that destination? Is like a startup that can actually raise uh, to build something that they see as like cool and unique, and that something that they want to see for Bitcoin. Maybe that's not your vibe, but maybe market forces are asking for like a different product or solution on the other side of that potential bridge implementation. Like, well, we can go build that too. I think maybe on net, what's on the other side of this bridge that is being built by the BitVM primitive is expressivity. So like you can have expressivity on the other side and it's up to the Bitcoin builders to like decide what they want to build either by market forces or their own intrinsic curiosity or whatever. Yeah. And there, there are, to be clear, there are teams building all the stuff that you're talking about. Like there are built teams like mm -hmm. building these other environments and these different like design trade-offs. But like once we get over that, that, that bridge, then we get into all the fun stuff that you guys are talking about. Like we talk about data availability layers. You talk about like what different type of execution environment you want. Like maybe somebody wants to build like, um, like a proof of stake style Bitcoin chain that specializes in, in DA, like all that stuff you can have. Um, one thing that we didn't mention, just so the audience knows, it's like, like a roll up in and of itself is not like a magic bullet, right? Because you still have to post that data in theory. Uh, like onto the, the Bitcoin L1. And because the blocks are, they're not one megabyte, they're technically four megabyte, you know, like a pure roll up could probably still only get like, I'm going to guess anywhere from like 10 to maybe like 50 X improvement in scaling if you're posting all of the data on the L1. Um, so that's, that's still pretty good. It's not bad. It can expand self custody, can make things a lot cheaper, mm -hmm. but eventually Bitcoin is going to have to go down the same path that Ethereum is going down where it's like you're going to have these these dedicated data availability layers. And that gets a little more advanced, a little more nuanced. Okay, so David, you presented that this as if people are willing to accept the N of one trust assumption, then we can eventually get to this world of expressivity on Bitcoin. Um, do you think the Bitcoin set of people, is that, that's, a, that's a pill to swallow. How big is that pill to swallow? Will people swallow that pill? Yeah, I do. I think it's going to be absolutely massive. I think you think you think people are going to largely as a whole, like the laser eyed maxis aside, Bitcoin is going to accept this N of one trust uh, assumption. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's good enough to get us there again to, to cross that chasm. And then you can get the, the, the fully ZK verified cross composable, you know, chains with like, you know, the beautiful UX and, 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 and the forked Ethereum smart contracts. Like, I think that's going to be good enough. And I think that there are beginning to be use cases that even the most ardent of Bitcoiners are like, oh, like, that's kind of dope. You know, like, I think that's, that's, <laughs> that's one of the, uh, one of the criticisms of like sidechains is sidechains were like a little bit ahead of their time. You know, like none of the good right. applications 
really came out until like, you know, DeFi summer. And yeah, there was so much freaking grift and so much scam and so many shitty products. But like the idea of, you know, being able to like borrow against your Bitcoin at 0% interest in like a li liquidity style, you know, with like a very small origination fee, provably over collateralized, like that is badass, you know? Mm -hmm. Account abstraction wallets is like an, another great one, you know, obviously sending private payments, you know, being able to earn yield, like, like there are, um, there are teams like I'll give a shout out to like Botanics, you know, they're, they're, they're doing this thing where you can stake Bitcoin, you can earn yield on it and it would create like a two way peg to, to another chain. And so they were thinking about building like an EVM chain. And I was like, guys, look at what Eigen DA is doing. Like well, you could stake your Bitcoin, you could create this separate layer. You could have a dedicated data availability layer that all of the rollups use and settle to. It's earning real fees because people are, are paying to, to, to use that blob space and all the ropes can be built on it. Like, like you can have, uh, uh, a decentralized AMM perpetuals platform that, you know, is going, uh, you know, long the, 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 the proof of stake Bitcoin and, you know, short in the perpetuals and you can create like, like the, the inverse perpetual, you know, stable coin, like, like this whole world, it, it, it really gives new life to the, to the Bitcoin monetary maximalist. Like right now, mm. all of these people are complaining about, you know, ordinals and inscriptions and it's like taking away from like, you know, the spam is like increasing fees and it's like pricing out, uh, you know, monetary use cases. It's like, well, you need a scaling solution that, that aligns with the higher fee environment where we can create economic density, where you could have dedicated rollups that do tons of transactions and tons of DeFi and tons of, 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 of privacy. And you could batch all of that and, and you're willing to bid way more than, than any of the inscription people in order to place your, your rollup transactions, um, you know, onto the L1, like, like that's how you beat out all this kind of arbitrary data on the L1. And I think so many Bitcoiners are just missing that. It's like, all right, guys, chill, like we're going to build it and you know, you're going to be happy. <laughs> okay. So in the world that you're describing kind of, I've always thought that building on Bitcoin is like building in a wasteland just because the whole entire construction of Bitcoin is just like optimizing for simplicity. You know, it's a, a philosophy of, uh, uh, subtraction rather than addition, make Bitcoin simpler, make it harder to build, build on Bitcoin, just have BTC the asset. Um, that's always been like my kind of like uh, philosophy is like how Bitcoin has grown. But what you're showing me is that like, well, maybe that was true with like the Bitcoin base layer. But once you build this Bitcoin VM thing, it goes from like building in a wasteland to just like fish in a barrel. Whereas like, well, there's all this other innovation that so many other ecosystems have already built. So we already have like a lot of the ideas and the research and development like out of the way. Now we just have to build it. So it's just like you can't you at, that, at some point you just can't miss like D, DA on Bitcoin. Somebody's got to go build that. Right. Like, I don't know, optimistic roll up or ZK roll up on Bitcoin. Somebody just go, go goes and builds that. Right. Yeah. Uh, so a Bitcoin builders renaissance, we've already seen the culture start to shift this way. What are some of the ideas that like are super hot like right now? What are people building that's very hyped in Bitcoin world? Well, well, if we Ryan and I were big Bitcoiners, what would we be excited about? Give, give us the next five episodes, Bitcoin of episodes Bankless, on Bankless. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I'm a bit biased here. I, I wrote an article in Bitcoin Magazine where I, I, I kind of talked about, uh, you know, Bitcoin backed stable coins, uh, you know, and I, and I referenced mm. like, like liquidity, like that is when I even I talked to my most like, you know, hardcore Bitcoin Maximus friends, I'm like, I'm like, oh, like you call yourself uh, a Bitcoiner, like, like you're never going to sell your, your Bitcoin until you have to. I'm like, you're selling your Bitcoin. I'm borrowing against it. And I'm doing it like without a custodian and I'm doing it zero percent interest. Like, like I'm more of a Bitcoiner than you, you know, I'm holding one lo 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 longer than you, you know, and just like, just, you know, like poke at them, of course, of course. Uh -huh. And, and then, you know, even if you get into to, to this world, like inevitably there are going to be people who like, they, they're just not ready for Bitcoin. They're like, they're like, I'm living in freaking Argentina, you know, off of like $5, you, you know, like I can't sit here and be having like a crazy volatile asset. They're like, I need stable coins, you know? And if you can say, well, Hey, look, here's this stable coin. It's, it's, it's decentralized. It's provably backed by Bitcoin. It can't be censored. Like that is a nice little ramp for them to get into this world. And then as they get savings, they can, they can invest it into Bitcoin. It's like all this stuff that, 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 that you guys have been talking about. I just think it's a better fit on Bitcoin and, and, and we're going to bring it. That's cool. Yeah. Is there anything else? Like I, I've, I've heard of uh, restaking protocols on Bitcoin. It's like one's called uh, Babylon that's crossed my desk uh, before. Um, obviously there's kind of like uh, everything that's going on with ordinals and BRC 20s and that kind of thing. Anything else that we should uh, keep our eyes open to? I mean, yeah, pretty much just like take off your guys' prior podcasts and things that you're excited about and say like, we can bring them on, on Bitcoin. I think account abstraction wallets, like I'm very excited about uh, I'm also really excited about the prospect. I mentioned this in the tweet, like this is pretty far future facing, but like 
if you could use something like storage proofs to to kind of trustlessly give an attestation from like a data availability layer, you know, you could use something like Celestia or like a dedicated Bitcoin DA layer, and you could relay that information trustlessly to the Bitcoin L1, and like that just kind of eliminates like the 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 risk of some of these data availability layers. David, this has been a fascinating conversation. This is uh, exactly what I hoped for when I opened up that that uh, tweet, and I didn't expect you to reply. And I, I just want to thank you for for replying. I mean, from my perspective, Bitcoin is maybe starting to get interesting again. Uh, I, I sort of left it off as sort of a, a store of value, and it's a uncensorable store of value, and that's great. One part of the bankless journey, but like it was missing DeFi, it was missing expressivity, it was missing all of the potential that Ethereum is unleashed. And if you're telling me that it's starting to get that back again. And there are some ways where it can start to follow more closely something, its own version, but something closer to the Ethereum roadmap. That to me is uh, very exciting and, and leads to a more bankless future. I, I guess I got to ask though, David, uh, are there are there more of you out there? Because no. I think the, uh, the overwhelming um, message from what like the the social layer, at least that is loudest in Bitcoin, does not talk in the way that you are talking. Is not a listener to the Bankless podcast necessarily. Is not focused on building. Is very focused on kind of like monetary properties and and like Robert Breedlove style, which is fantastic, right? But just like he's not talking about this sort of thing, and is thinking still thinking that uh, Lightning is going to solve everything, all of the Bitcoin scalability problems. And uh, yeah, are there more people like you actually like digging in and coming up with these new uh, roll-up style solutions on Bitcoin? How many uh, of you are there? I mean, you could probably count it on, you know, one hand. Uh, but um, <laughs> okay. no, 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 no. I mean, uh, in all seriousness, like it, it's a small but, 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 but growing movement. The problem is, is like, there are some projects out there that are trying to like hijack this narrative that, that, that really are not the true builders it's it's for sure grifting. It's for sure scams, and 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 I think people need to like really have their guard up, not to go like full on Bitcoin maximalist, but like, yeah, like this stuff is real, but a lot of the stuff you will end up seeing on Twitter is definitely not. And you know, Ryan, kind of what you were saying, like I remember, I, I forget it was a podcast you guys had like many years ago, and somebody came on and just like really applauded you guys and said like like when you guys were getting into it, like nobody gave a shit about Ethereum. It wasn't even like, hey, that was a bad idea. It's like, dude, we don't even want to talk about Ethereum. Like, like, why are you guys doing this right now? Right. And you like, you stuck to your guns because like you understood the the potential and the revolution. And you said, I don't care. Like, like I, you know, will 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 will, will die on this hill because I essentially believe in it. And there is that small contingent of us that feel the same way about what is potentially happening in Bitcoin. And sometimes I look back and I'm like, oh man, like if I found Bitcoin in like, you know, in like 2011 or, or, or whatever, like, like what I have had the conviction to like stay on, stay in it. And the answer is like, you know, probably not. Who, who knows? But, you know, back then, like you don't have the foresight of like all of this development work that's already been done of like all of the podcasts of all of the articles. But that's kind of how I feel about this, this, this whole broader like L2 renaissance and, and what's possible in, in the Bitcoin world. Like, I don't care if it sinks or swims. I'm pretty sure it's going to be very successful. But even if it's not, like, this is ideas worth pursuing. You know, like, we are freaking, you know, missionaries, not mercenaries. And if people disagree with it, it's like, bring it on. You know, I'm on Twitter all day, you know. <laughs> well, I love that. That level of conviction is going to get you and the small but growing tribe uh, quite far. And I uh, totally applaud it. I mean, this is very much... Uh, you know, bankless aligned, I would say. Very, very excited to have more bankless money systems built on top of Bitcoin. So, uh, David, um, I'm going to ask people, include in the show notes a link to your, your Twitter account because uh, I was not following you before this, my mistake, but I am now following you. And you, my friend, are going to be my Bitcoin signal, I hope, so I can start to parse out what's Bitcoin real and what's Dave. not. You're the go-to now, Bitcoin Dave. So uh, <laughs> like with that power comes great responsibility. Please do not lead us astray. You know, Show us where the true decentralized uh, roll-ups are building on Bitcoin. And uh, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, thanks, guys. And I do want to give a quick shout out to people like uh, John Light, you know, Robin Linus, uh, you know, Alexi, uh, Orkin, like these are like the true builders. Uh, and people, if they follow me and see their names, like, like, like those are real deal people. There you go. And of course, Satoshi, who started it all, right? Right, Bitcoin Dave? All right, I can't thanks, forget guys. him or them. Uh, thanks, Dave. Yeah, the, uh, the Twitter handle is David underscore C-Roy. So D-A-V-I-D underscore 
C. Roy. Got to end with this. Of course, crypto is risky. You could lose what you put in, but we are headed west. Frontier is not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the bankless journey. Thanks a lot. 